Hello, everybody. It is my pleasure to be moderator for today's discussion on mega SACS programs. Before we get started, I wanted to give a chance for our panelists to introduce themselves so we can set the stage and learn a little bit more about each organization, uh, whether it's a domestic organization or a global organization, what kind of um, number of entities we're talking about, and a little bit more background for from each uh, of our panelists today. Ken, why don't you start? Yeah, th thanks, Yulia. So I'm, I'm Ken Garofalo. I'm the leader of the IA function at Lidol. We're a global manufacturer of specialty filtration and advanced materials products. My history with SOX goes all the way back to the implementation over the years through the SEC guidance and PCAOB guidance that's come out in the past um, 15 years or so. Um, so, you know, been heavily involved in, in SOX scoping process across companies, both large and, and small, as well as setting the, um, the testing approaches. So happy to be here today to share some um, perspective. Thank you, Luis. Luis, for the uh, head of internal audit and SOCs here at uh, Ancourt Capital Group. Uh, we are a uh, specialty financial services company. We're um, mostly uh, dedicated to the secondary debt uh, servicing. We do have about 20 years of experience with SOCs on and off uh, since the beginning. So uh, looking forward to discussing uh, with you in the panel. Thank you, and Michelle. Hello, I'm Michelle Wallin. I head up internal audit at Post Holdings. We're a global food manufacturer, and you probably know us best for Post and multiple meal brand cereals. We also make the Premier Shakes and the Bob Evans refrigerated sides in your grocery store. Um, I work for a company that's very acquisition friendly. So scoping of socks and efficient execution is a hot topic for us. And it's something that I've been working on in large companies um, for quite some time. So I'm looking forward to our discussion today. With that, and uh, we can start with our first question, which is how do you determine what controls are in scope for SOX compliance when you have over 10 in scope entities? Luis, would you like to start with this question? There's multiple ways of determining uh, what controls are in scope, uh, especially whenever you go to um, IT controls or uh, business process controls or entity level controls. Um, you can you first have to de uh, to determine which ones which entities are in scope and whatever the method you use uh, for one company may not be the method for another company. A uh, company that has uh, that has uh, stores, for example, and is retail, you may want to go ahead and define every single one of those retail locations as an uh, as a component. So you, you're talking about locations there. Uh, is locations the right method to use it? Well, maybe not. Uh, maybe you want to go ahead and group some of those into control environments and say companies are. Um, a, ma a major whole company may define their components as a group of companies um, if your company has 100 or 200 companies under its belt and you are the holding company, you may just group them by control environment. And we're going to define a component differently here uh, as a group of companies that actually um, that actually shared a control environment or share a general ledger or share a network. Um, so how do you define your entities and your controls in scope? Um, it's, it's much more a tailored exercise to the type of company that you are talking once you have defined your entities, not all the controls need to be in scope, and we'll talk about that later, um, but you may decide that if this is a call center, for example, well, this is a this is a component that actually generates a lot of expenses, but no revenue. So I'm just going to scope the controls that are related to the expenses cycle um, rather than uh, in scoping other types of controls. So back to you, Julian. Uh, probably you may want to hear from another panelist how they do it. Thank you, Luis. And uh, Ken, you probably have a little different perspective or anything that you would like to share with us today. Yes. Um, you know, one thing that I would say here that that's really important is is when you start with your scoping exercise, it needs to start with sizing up the company, as, as Luis was saying. So when I think about sizing up a company, you have to consider, OK, well, what are the quantitative metrics that are relevant for your your industry and your and your type of company? So some examples could be sales, um, gross margin, operating income, total assets, et cetera. Whatever, whatever metrics are most relevant in your, um, in your industry. 
And then what you what you need to do is once you once you have your company sized up, you can almost break it into tiers of helping to determine what's in scope and what's not in, in scope. You've done that quantitative assessment, you could layer in qualitative um, things such as um, people capabilities and tenure within your auditable entities, um, IT systems, control history, et cetera. So then, so then you, you know, you give more, more definition through doing that to your, um, to your tier structure. And it's a way of, of managing the, the entities and controls that are going to be within the scope of your testing program. Okay, excellent. Michelle, maybe you could speak a little bit about the scoping. And, um, you know, along with the lines, we just got a question from the audience, which I think would be a good timing for all of you to uh, contribute if you would like. Uh, does full scope mean that your audit control, you audit controls for each financial statement line item process behind the line item? So, Michelle, I'll start with you and then we can see if anybody else has uh, additional feedback. Thank you. So I guess generally, um, when I think of full scope, I do think of every significant financial statement line item for that company. I think it's a little bit of a trick question from the standpoint of an individual balance sheet or income statement of any given entity that you're looking at may not have all financial statement line items that appear on your consolidated financial statements. So mm -hmm. as Ken was saying, you know, doing that quantitative of really looking at which financial statement lines are even material to the consolidated balance is your starting place. And for purposes of tiering or scoping to say full scope, sometimes full scope means all, sometimes it means almost all, but it's a way to categorize. You know, that you're, it's not partial, it's not a limited scope, it's, it's more in that full scope category. And it's really just a, a way to speak of things so that your audit committee and management can understand the scope of procedures you're performing. The only other thing I would add to scoping is, you know, when you're looking at the um, the breadth of your companies, I know I've been in situations where we may have a lot of individual entities that are very similar in size and may contribute to that um, scope percentage in a very similar way. And the tendency is to always pick that one that is the largest. I would encourage all of us to think a little bit more about not only other risk factors, but also how do we rotate a little bit and make it so that we are providing management a little more coverage year to year instead of um, taking the easier path of choosing the same um, companies or entities on a on a year to year basis. Excellent, thank you. Um, one more question that came came in, and obviously it's a it's a hot topic for everybody since we have a lot of questions coming in is. Uh, how often, um, it, in your experience, the control scoping changes? Uh, how, how significantly does it change year over year? I would say uh, year over year it is a severe understatement. Uh, and reality is much more month over month or week over week. Um, as a business adapts and certain processes are decommissioned or certain systems are decommissioned, certain new systems uh, come online, uh, you have to be agile these days to bring that system in line. If you're waiting until next year, uh, probably you're, you're um, on a mega SOX program that covers multiple locations, you're not being agile enough for the current environment. You have to be on top of it uh, right now. Um, another of the questions that came is, uh, how do you use data analytics? Well, that's one of the best uses of um, of uh, data analytics for scoping, because you can see which accounts are actually picking up activity and which accounts are decreasing in activity. Do I need to, because I want to answer one of the questions uh, that was before, that you asked before, Julia, from the uh, audience, uh, do I need to have all of the um, all of the accounts always in scope, every single financial statement line item for every single component. Um, not really unless your audit committee has a very, very, very uh, <laughs> low tolerance for risk uh, and a very high um, budget for you uh, because it will cost you a lot to have every single immaterial line item uh, in scope. Uh, you want to be agile and do that risk assessment um, as often as possible. Um, I do recommend doing it at least twice a year, if not quarterly, because uh, you're going to see that certain activity in certain accounts is going to decrease, and you're going to go to the business and say, like, yeah, we, we are divesting or we're reducing that line of business. So the risk there may have been immaterial immateri before and immaterial now. So you want you may want to just keep those controls are non-ski non and 
monkey or probably be scoped that for the year if you believe that it's not going to reach your materiality level. Um, so hopefully that answers a couple of the questions here. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, one last question on this topic, I think. Uh, we have a few coming in, so, so we'll try to get through as many as we can. And I think we touched a little bit on that, but uh, a couple of questions came in around uh, thresholds, percentages, anything that you can share as to how you approach your risk assessment and scoping. Ken, maybe you can speak a little bit to how you approach your scoping. Yeah, I mean, when you have um, when you have an environment where you have multiple audit auditable entities, you know, one of the ways, you know, we talked a little bit about tiering. But one of the ways to, to structure it is, is as you as you size it up to look at the, the bottom first and say, OK, if, if you have entities that that represent um, less than five percent of sales or less than five percent of, of a metric that your company widely uses, you know, that that's kind of a way of, of, of pairing back or at least segregating the entity that I've seen. Um, so usually sales is a is a is a key metric a lot of folks use and. You know, if it's an entity that's less than 5% of sales, generally you can treat it a little differently than maybe some other entities. Agreed. And reaching that threshold of maybe a, anywhere from 75 to 85% uh, of total coverage um, in the key areas of maybe EBITDA, total sales, um, total assets, total liabilities, it's somewhat dependent on your company, um, also somewhat dependent on your external audit firm. but. Uh, definitely more than you know, 50 or 60 percent is always required, and something less than 100 because you start getting over 90 percent. Um, and as Luis was saying, you can get pretty inefficient. All right, uh, let's talk about something that I think is near to most of us here, especially being in a public company, is the involvement of external audit. Right? You know, how do they influence our in scope controls and their reliance strategy? Um, so in this case, maybe I'll start with Michelle. So I think we all know that we need to involve our internal auditors, not only early, but often throughout this process. I know as we are um, executing acquisitions, even in the middle of a year, we're talking with our external auditors about what impact that might have on the future, um, just to start the conversation early. Um, but I do think it's internal audit's responsibility to always come with a point of view and always come with um, your homework done and have thought through what you believe will work for your company, um, what your management is comfortable with, and um, have a rationale for that. But a healthy dialogue is always encouraged. I know that I've always learned some things and we've adjusted and compromised um, throughout that process. Um, I don't think there's always just one right answer. So. Um, I think the best way to involve your external auditor is to keep up that good communication and um, make sure that you have a relationship that allows you to do that. Absolutely. Ken. Yeah, as, as Michelle was saying, certainly you know, getting the um, external auditor involved early in the process is, um, is critical. So what that means is if you're assuming you're a calendar year um, company, you should be having those discussions either now or or over the past um, past few weeks, um, important that they they understand the scope of, of the company's um, plan SOX activities. And then for them to be able to um, inform their reliance strategy, and the sooner you you talk with your external auditors about the um, the reliance strategy, the more the more likely that strategy is to be um, implemented and effective throughout the um, throughout the year. Okay, Luis, how is your relationship with external auditors going? <laughs> you want to make this is a very key um, success factor for any SOX program because you want to make the project as efficient as possible. Uh, you want, yes, you want to encourage an external audit to use the work of internal audit and to take a reliance controls approach. Uh, you also want to make that process as smooth and as uh, easy for both the external auditor, the internal auditor, and also uh, the business uh, that you're auditing. Um, so the, the, it is not only whether your external auditor is taking a reliance, a controls reliance strategy on that uh, business unit, but it is also what can you as internal audit do or what you as a manager of that SOX program do to avoid the internal auditor going and trying to audit a control and the external auditor going separately 
at testing exactly the same control and taking uh, duplicate samples on it? Can you can you coordinate with your external auditor um, on sampling methodology um, so that if we are picking 20 samples and the external auditor requires 25 or 30 um, and they can use some of these samples and they can uh, increase the use of internal audit work. Uh, is there any way um, that we can, we can go ahead and coordinate and rather than doing two walkthroughs of a control, um, mm -hmm. having everybody in the same room look at the same process uh, together and post questions together um, and make it more efficient for the business, make it more efficient for uh, the company and also easier on the external auditor. Uh, so it is it is in the best interest of everybody to make the process as efficient and as fast as possible. So uh, coordinating with the external auditor on sampling methodology, sam minimal sam minimum sample requirements, uh, even attributes all the way down to the control level. Um, does your external auditor need more attributes tested and can you uh, internally do that uh, and add that uh, attribute or request that information for them so that whenever uh, they um, they go testing it is readily available. Something that is great in audit board uh, is that you can give the abilities to your um, to your external auditor to actually add document requests there in them so that whenever you request uh, information for a control, both internal and external audit requests are going out at the same time users are actually uh, uh, providing those requests into the control uh, directly. There's a timestamp of who entered it, who provided it, at what, um, at what time they provided it, and there's also version control. So your external auditor, let's say you marked up a document internal for internal audit, your external auditor always can, always can go back in the historical of that document and revert to the original version and say, this is the original version that was uploaded and provided by the business. I want to start my test with the original version, regardless of what internal audit did. did. Because remember, your external auditor, even though they may take a controls reliance approach, uh, they may not always be able to use uh, their uh, the work of internal audit. They may have to do independent sampling. They may have to do independent testing. So they may want to revert to the uh, original documentation and even request supplemental doc documentation on top of that. So coordinating with external audit, key. We talked obviously about the coordination and scoping, but everybody wants to know how can you increase the reliance? So what's the strategy? What are some some helpful tips we can share with the audience today in terms of increasing the external auditor's reliance on the work of internal auditor. Um, I know we touched a little bit here and there, but Luis, do you want to provide some other helpful takeaways for the audience? Whether the external auditor relies on internal audit uh, work or not, or take a, it takes a controlled reliance approach, um, it, it's really the external auditor's goal because the external auditor is independent. Um, how can you give the external auditor that comfort? Number one, your management needs to have a very good internal control system. It needs to be solid. Um, otherwise, your external auditor is not going to trust that enough to take, a, to take a controls reliance approach, and they are going to take a substantive approach, and that is their call. Uh, so once you have a solid internal audit, um, a solid internal control uh, environment on one area, how can you... Um, how can you make it easier for your external auditor um, to test those controls and the like? Um, that's where the technology really helps a lot, and that's where the coordination really helps a lot. How often do you talk to your external auditor? Uh, depends on how spread your external auditor is, whether it depends on whether you have one external auditor on a mega SOX control program. It is not uncommon that it belongs to a mega company and, or an international corporation. So if that is a case of uh, somebody in the audience, which I that it is a case of a lot of people. Um, you, it is not uncommon that you have more than one external auditor relying uh, on um, on a, one, more than one external auditor on your external auditor, and one of them is relying on the work of the other. Um, especially if you have multiple countries involved, multiple regions involved, um, multiple types of businesses involved, it is not uncommon that you have one external auditor for this country and then the internal auditor of the holding company is going to be relying on that one. It is up to you to coordinate with all of them because all of them will be making those decisions independently of the other. Uh, so your, your coordination increases. So how often do you... 
communicate with your external auditors. I do recommend it as often, but I'm, I don't want to give anybody a guidance, oh, it got to be weekly or monthly or every two weeks, because it depends on how many external auditors or how complex your audit, external audit structure um, is, uh, and that will vary from company to company. Uh, but measuring what those auditors are using, uh, somebody asked a question, um, what is uh, what is a percentage that is acceptable, uh, or what mm-hmm. is a what is a target percentage? That will depend on your industry. That will depend on your company. That will depend on how good your control environment is. Uh, that will depend on the quality of your own test work uh, and the tools that you have in place to share with your external auditor. Uh, that information. Um, it will depend on a lot of factors. Uh, I wanted to level set everybody. It's never going to be hundred um, percent. It is never going to be. Even even 95%, so you should set your expectations way south of that. Um, but uh, you you really want to uh, get that coordination with it, your external auditor. If you want to get, hey, what would be the best target, assuming optimal uh, coordination, assuming optimal control environment, ask your external auditor. Uh, the guidance will actually vary from firm to firm, uh, depending on the external auditor you have, depending on the industry that you have, and the perceived risk on your company. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, we can uh, move on to our next topic, which is uh, testing approach and strategy. So again, since we're talking about large uh, number of controls, right? You know, when we have either large number of controls or entities, how you know how are we going to design the program, and how are we making sure that the controls are designed and operating effectively? Are there any specific techniques you employ to provide assurance controls are operating as expected? Ken, do you want to start with the, your experience? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that back when we were talking about scoping, we were talking about putting the entities into tiers. And I think it's important to, to really size up every company and, and develop those tiers because those tiers are what, you know, can help um, – help tailor the approach and really um, really help to manage the level of, of work when you have 1,000 plus uh, in scope controls. So, you know, by, by putting the, um, the entities into tiers, you can then, you know, define your testing approach by tier. So for example, you know, your, your top tier entities may may get full scope um, testing and you'll test all the key controls related to that entity. Um, your next tier down, it may be a targeted approach depending on um, materiality of certain account balances. Um, and then the next tier down, you may say, well, well, you know, for these, we can rely on our entity level controls, our account fluctuation analysis, our monthly operating reviews, our, um, our periodic, um, financial statement, balance sheet, um, reviews that the corporate teams may do, um, oversights. It's, you know, there's a lot of different ways to, to slice and dice this, but it's important that you do that and you do that up front because it's a, it's a key way of, of managing the overall uh, tax testing effort. Thank you, Ken. And, and Michelle, I know when we're planning uh, a little bit for this conversation, you mentioned audit board has really helped you with your program. Can you speak to that, to the group? Yeah, so I think technology, um, efficient use of technology is one way to um, really reduce the effort when you've got a lot of controls that end up in scope. And one um, one thing that I always say is just keeping it simple. Um, so having a methodology that is very consistent across all of your in-scope entities, or, you know, you can end up with a lot of different internal audit people, a lot of internal audit geographies, a lot of um, cultures that are involved across the various companies and countries that may be in scope. But when you've got testing templates that are available on audit board and pushed out and utilized the exact same way, and then you've got consistent risks and consistent controls that are applied across your organization, not, not only helps internal audit, but it really helps external audit too with that reliance strategy and with just the comfort of knowing that you've got an effective control environment. I'll also give a plug for just the linkage component there. So one testing approach that we've utilized, especially across our IT general controls, is you know when you've got um, a logical access control 
that may be performed at a company or a corporate level and utilized for various ERPs or various applications, you can actually just test it once and then link it to all of those other controls throughout your organization. And it's very easily seen, very easily communicated with your external auditors. Um, so it's another way to just have that dashboard way of knowing that you've actually completed that work. Excellent, thank you. Uh, one more question that came in, which I think is very relevant to everybody is data analytics. And how is data analytics used in uh, planning and testing phases of your SAX program? I have a quick answer. Louise probably can, can speak a little more to it, but you know, I think that anytime you're able to utilize, um, whether it's only from your consolidation tool or if it's from your ERP system, to get that data and be able to run the analytics to see coverage quickly and easily and pull out materiality, um, it makes that process so much faster. Absolutely. Luis, we want to make sure we hear from you as well. To add on to that, um, if you have a an audit software tool, now you have data on your own audit function and how those controls are uh, are performing. Now you know how they perform in the prior year, prior two years, prior three years, because you you start building a record, um, mm -hmm. and and that data analytics, uh, that data can actually be analyzed and say, wait, wait a second, I have a testing program that I most companies test uh, twice a year. Uh, I test my controls operating effectiveness uh, interim and at uh, annual. Some others have three rounds, four rounds, uh, test quarterly. Uh, do I have to follow that for all controls or can I just create a uh, more efficient, lighter approach for controls that are lower risk? And this goes back to what Ken was mentioning, tiering your controls and saying, if this control has never failed in the last three years um, and this is a lower risk control, do I need to submit this control to the same rigor of testing to a control that uh, failed last year and is a high risk control? Uh, probably not. And probably you can create different tiers and say, well, uh, these controls we're going to test earlier in the game. These controls we're going to give a lower um, a lower coverage. We're not going to cover all the way if it's a, uh, all the way till December 31st. Uh, we're going to cut off the the coverage at some point around November or around October. Even though we're going to give coverage to all quarters, uh, we're not going to give coverage up to December um, because this is a lower risk control. Or you can tailor that testing uh, methodology uh, in coordination with your external auditor, in coordination with your audit committee uh, and their risk tolerance um, and their preferences uh, to what your program actually is demanding and use the data that you have available to tailor your scoping and your testing strategy. Okay, and, and Ken, what's your experience with data analytics? Yeah, well, when, when you talk about using data analytics as part of your testing phase, you know, there's, there are some um, common data analytics that can probably be used across all companies. Um, you know, one area where, where I've used it before and, and that comes to mind is manual journal entries. So mm -hmm. controls over manual journal entries are going to be a, a control that exists across many um, companies. And, you know, there, there's different data analysis that you can run on, on um, manual journal entries. Are there even dollar entries? Are there... Um, entries with unusual account combinations? Are there entries that are booked on, uh, on weekends or at, you know, non-working hour times or even dollar entries, et cetera? There's a, you know, there's a whole series of um, analytics that you can, you can do that are, that are fairly commonplace and not too, um, not too difficult to run on a recurring basis once they're, um, once they're set up. So, if, if I think about data analytics and you think about how how is the external auditor using data analytics in their work, they're doing the same thing with um, with journal entries. So that's just, um, you know, the uh, analytics tools used um, pretty heavily. In. Uh, let's switch gear a little bit and talk about the last 12 months, which obviously was a lot of learning experience, new learning experience for probably everybody in different ways, but um, most importantly, focusing on today's topic of programs and lack of ability for most of us, if not all of us, to be on site to travel requirements, or did you have to make some adjustments or modifications to your program? So I think that all of us traditionally perform some of our work um, remotely. We didn't go to every location and, and do all of our testing um, on site. So 
internal audit, I think, had a leg up in that we were effectively using either Microsoft Teams or some other desktop sharing tool. And um, we know how to test remotely. Audit Board also helped immensely with that and just the pure communication aspect um, and being able to communicate not only with our team, but with all of our control owners. One thing that I'd say was a little different for us and that we utilized differently this year was um, thinking of the aspects of Workstream and the projects that we can kick off there. Um, trying to understand not only at an individual and com but company level where and how um, individuals like to be communicated with. So in some cases, we sent those certifications um, monthly or quarterly because that was our way and they liked that of being checking in and making sure that they understood the control, they knew, understood the expectation. Others wanted to have Teams meetings. Others wanted to just communicate by email. You know, So understanding how to communicate with them and the best way to um, meet their individual needs, um, we just had a lot of options um, through the use of um, audit board and kicking off, whether it be narrative updates um, through the tool or just being able to chat and be able to communicate on a real-time basis. Ken, do you have uh, any other insights into this uh, topic? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, when you think about um, proactively impacting the culture of, of control compliance, you know, we were talking a little bit when Louise was talking about the capabilities of, um, of audit board. And so, you know, I've seen folks do a, a few things with, with audit board that can really be proactive and improve the culture of compliance. The first thing with these um, quarterly self-assessments, um, you know, I, I've seen them done quarterly where you ask the control owners, have you completed this control activity at the defined frequency over the course of the past quarter? And then you're supporting documentation to that quarterly self-assessment. So it helps, you know, and, and then that's available for supervisors and other reviewers to see, and it helps to develop a repository of control documentation that can then be leveraged, um, you know, through internal audit testing and by the external auditors as well. So, you know, it helps drive a, a culture of compliance that I think is um, repository to make um, the control owners' lives easier down the line when it comes time for testing. The second thing I've seen is, a, is an annual um, refresh process in Audit Board for process narratives. You know, so we all know that when we use Audit Board, all our changes are tracked and there's different reports and, and history we can get on, on changes to narratives, but you can also run using the Workstream um, capabilities, um, a confirmation process around, you know, have all your narratives been updated and and completed. And I find that the narrative refreshes are, you know, really just a proactive way, again, to to ensure that people understand their processes and controls that they're going to be executing over the course of, you know, the following months. All right, Michelle, any, anything you would like to add? The only other additional thing we do to be proactive is every year when we are holding our walkthrough meetings and obtaining that test of design, um, we always have some education slides included in there. So whether it's um, how to how to provide better um, information on completeness and accuracy, how to be able to make sure that they're meeting all the requirements of the documentation, that's one way for us to be proactive is early on in the process, make sure, especially if there's new people, but just reiterate, keep training. Um, how does external audit, uh, how does audit board manage external auditors requests? Um, so it, it is, it has to do with your, your maturity model on your maturity use of audit board. You're going to see that for those of you that are implementing audit board right now, um, and you receive a list of 25, 30 documents that your external auditor, um, actually, uh, wants, um, internal audit, uh, teams that are very immature using audit board will go ahead and say like, Hey, um, Joe, this is, uh, the um, the uh, three documents that external audit uh, wants, can you please load it into this control and paste the link? 
you're still using email. Uh, as you evolve in your use of Otterboard, you're going to see that the Workstream module can create a project where you can just go ahead and put all of those in the PVC list um, and generate a project specific for the external auditors. If you keep maturing into the use of Otterboard, you can go ahead on your controls on the testing section on the PVC request of each test and say, these are the documents that external that internal audit requires, and these are the documents that external audit requires uh, re will require, and go ahead and proactively request them both. Um, whenever the documents do not change uh, from year to year, that is extremely easy. Uh, whenever the documents do change from year to year, um, that becomes a little bit more complicated because you will have to coordinate with external audit and say like, hey, uh, you requested the month of March and September last year. Are those still the months that you want this year or you want to change your selection before we kick this off? Uh, but it can be done. And again, it will depend on the maturity of the team um, using uh, Audit Board's Workstream module. Thank you, Luis. Um, so we're Unfortunately, at a time, um, I wanted to take a moment again to thank our panelists for wonderful insights and for taking the time today to share your insights with the audience. We really appreciate it. Thank you.